we're able to click buy. Great. Uh, so we're recording this session, which is also good because everybody will be able to refer back to that. And anyone who wasn't here will also be able to, to see what we're talking about tonight. Uh, so back to the process, uh, as we move through this process, what we do is we take intellectual property from all of our great research and academic institutions across the state. And then we do a 10 week program starting the night where we build business concepts around those intellectual properties, starting off with a showcase event tonight called the IP parade. Uh, so if anybody's ever taken a part of that, many of you that I've seen on tonight have been through this experience before. It's rather unique. Uh, it's kind of one of those things where we supply the IP as a state, and then we bring on uh, volunteer founders to form these teams. And at the end, we pitch to a, a panel of uh, investors and other subject matter experts uh, and pick a winner. And it's a really great and unique event. Uh, so the founders supply the entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. and the uh, innovation, and then we also supply them with the intellectual property. And then we teach them how to be entrepreneurs along the way. It's a great event for those who have never been through entrepreneurship studies before or training. It's a great opportunity for the researchers and IP holders to understand how to get their product to market. Uh, it's a great opportunity for our technology partners uh, to, uh, to work with us from our technology transfer offices to all work together to get these things from a commercialized non-state inside research and out to the general market. Also, as we move through these things and bring on more startups and more founders, there's opportunities to bring opportunity these businesses to uh, research facilities as well. So that's also a goal of ours as we move forward. So as we go through tonight, we're going to let each IP holder present their intellectual property. Each IP holder will have five minutes to present, and then we'll have a few minutes of question and answer. With the number of intellectual properties that we have tonight, which is nine, hopefully we'll have all, get through all of those. Uh, we're going to try to keep very tightly to that schedule. If you have questions, and we've already gone through our three minutes, so I generally last ask for two or three questions, depending on the answers and how long they are. If you have more questions about that specific IP that just happened, you can drop those in the chat, and the IP holder and you can go back and forth in the chat. Uh, we'll also share the transcript from the chat so everybody has that. At the end of all the presentations, I'll share a Google form that has the top five ranking IPs. What we do is ask the volunteer founders to give us their preference. We do take that into account. And then my team, we work together to pick the top, top five IPs. With the number of founders that we have out of the number of IPs, we can only form so many teams. We won't have teams with only one or two people on there. That's not a very good count of founders for a team. It's just too much work for one or two people. So what we do is usually have a minimum of three. So if we have 16, 17, right now we have about 17 founders. Hopefully we'll have a couple more before the end of tomorrow. Uh, we will form probably five teams of that. So we'll pick five IPs, maybe six, uh, but hopefully at least five. So we'll have five teams with three to four people per team. Uh, and that's what we'll do. So we'll send a form at the end and you'll choose the top, you'll stack rank your top five and we'll take that into account and we'll pick the teams. Okay. So don't have a lot of time for questions about our process. I think you'll see how it goes as we walk through it. So I'm not gonna open the up to the floor for questions. I'd rather just go ahead and get started if that's okay with everybody. I'm gonna wait for answers for that. Uh, but if we're ready to go, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so first up is from Oak Ridge. I did send out the agenda. So hopefully everyone is ready to roll in the order that we talked about right about 6.10. So the first one up is from Oak Ridge with the shielding system for wireless power transfer. If whoever is presenting can come off of mute, come on video, start waving their hands, tell me who you are so I can give you co-hosts so you can start chatting. I got four and two is the title of your thing. All right, I'll Hi. make you co-host. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. All right, and I just made you co-host. If you can confirm that, you can start sharing your full, your whatever file. Okay. Um, there you go. We start to see it come up right now. Now I'm gonna start the clock when you're ready. Phone settings. There we go. We see it perfectly. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mustak Mahmoud. I'm an R and D staff in uh, Oakley's National Laboratory. Uh, the proposed technology is the electromagnetic shielding for extreme fast wireless charging system for electric vehicles. Uh, my co-PIs are Omir Onar and Veda Galigakare. Uh, as a brief introduction of the system, so this figure at the center shows the wireless charging for electric vehicle application. 
where we have a transmitter pad uh, on the, uh, placed on the ground and a receiver pad placed under the vehicle. Uh, and the power is transferred mainly through the magnetic field. So there is a chance that they under, uh, a part of the magnetic field will leak inside and around the vehicle. However, for the safety of the human and, and health, this magnetic field inside and around the vehicle must be below 21 amps per meter or 27 microtesla. However, so the plot on the lower right shows the hundreds of data points done by the Society of the Automotive Engineers that shows that even at 11 kilowatt, a large part of the test point exceeds that safety limit. So this is a big problem because this is the test result for 11 kilowatt and, and we want to transfer power for hundreds of kilowatt. Now, the wireless charging brings flexibility for the automated EV charging and make it flexible. However, currently the home charging is in, in the range of three to seven kilowatt. The commercial charging is, is currently in the, in, the, in the range of 400 kilowatt. If we go for the electric bus charging, that will range up to one megawatt. And in the last slide, we have seen that the safety limit is, is, is exceeding the, the, the health uh, limit at even uh, 11 kilowatt power. So, so that's the problem we, we solved in, in this uh, invention. Now, going from 11 kilowatt to 300 kilowatt power transfer system, so all we need, we have now quite efficient wireless charging system, but we need a shielding to, to reduce this field emission. Now, without a reliable or effective shielding, we, we cannot uh, go beyond this limit of low power application. And we have found that the EV, uh, manufacturer and, and wireless charging suppliers are the main uh, target people for, for this type of technologies. Now, this one shows the, the solution that, that we have proposed here, uh, that the proposed technology consists of multi-layer magnetic shield compared to the traditional uh, conductive shield in, in the current market. So we have developed the system consisting of multiple layer of magnetic and aluminum shield and proposed a method how to optimize this system so that the cost and the mass will be minimized. Because one of the main target is reducing the additional amount of volume and mass that we mount under the vehicle. That must be minimized to its uh, lowest point. And under the experimental test that we'll show later that we reduce this field emission uh, for hundreds of kilowatts power. The technology is currently in, in TRL level four where we are testing uh, in the lab setup. Uh, the prototype has been tested for 11 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt, and a 50 kilowatt system. We have developed a 100 kilowatt polyphase wireless charging system shield that's shown on the right figure, which we are currently testing this one for Hyundai Kona. And we have designed one system for 300 kilowatt wireless charging system that we shall next year test for Porsche Taycan. Uh, now, this one compares how the proposed technology of ORNL compared to the existing solution. Uh, so there are different type of coil topologies, but there is no shielding technology for the bipolar charging pad, which is one of the most prominent charging pad. And our proposed technology using the magnetic shield is particularly very effective for the bipolar wireless charging system. And, and through the experimental test, we have seen that it reduces emission by more than 85%. And then we can customize it to, to go beyond that to reach for that megawatt level power transfer with, with safety limit. Uh, the impact we have investigated the current uh, EV charging market was 17.6 billion. Uh, and and, and the, the growth rate is around 30.26, which, which will make it around uh, 111 billion by 2028. So this proposed technology can make a big impact uh, uh, also, a safer automated and fast wireless charging will significantly accelerate the, the EV adoption, which is one of the very important factor, how, how we can accelerate the EV adoption through most convenient charging technology. Uh, so this chart uh, compares with ORNL technology with four major player in this, in this field now, that is Y2CT, Evatron, Wave, and Lumen Freedom, the major manufacturer of the EV wireless charging system. And then it compares the wireless technology uh, with respect to the different features. Um, so with the time, time limited, thank you everyone for listening. That was perfect. You were at 507. And I need to commend you because usually we don't see specs with financials and 
things like that, especially a competitive matrix or competitive analysis slide. So that's really good. We'll build upon that if this is one of the IPs that we work in inside of our, our process here. So I won't take up the time asking questions. Let's ask the audience. Does the audience have any questions about this IP that they would like to hear more about? If so, just come on mute, just ask the question. Okay, going once. Anything you'd like to add since you have some air time? Uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you so much. One thing I, yeah, as you mentioned at the very early stage, uh, I, I prepared the slides not knowing what to present, what is the target. So uh, learning a, a little bit more about that would be very helpful. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that looking from my perspective, looking at your deck, I think there's a lot to validate. I think there's a lot to build upon. I, I mean, I think you've done a, a great job of describing the technology and where the benefits could be. I think what we would build upon in this process is really validating uh, the value proposition and really truly understanding where the beachhead is. That's what we call that initial sales target, right? How are you going to get that? Is it through a partnership? Is that through some some other sort of agreement where you're bringing this to another OEM or another major manufacturer? Are you going directly market? And this is also where we start talking about direct consumer B two B and that and, and stuff like that. So um, you had a lot of stuff in there that I was really pleasantly surprised to see. Uh, and then there's a lot of things to validate and build upon too. So I think it was a great deck presentation. I really appreciate the effort that you put forth into it. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna withdraw the co-host permission there. Thank you very much. And I'll stop the clock. And we're right at seven minutes. So next is from Cumberland Emerging Technologies and Auburn University, uh, nanoparticle drug formulation for cancer therapy. So this is one of our cypher So who do we have, Jim, point out who's- Right here, presentation? yeah. Okay. I'm here, Brian, so and by the way, you had- I thought we had seven minutes, so mine's closer to that. You said seven and five for questions. You know, it, 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 so. we, I, we had to pivot a little bit because we had trying to limit gotcha. time. Shoot, shoot, shoot I'll talk fast. I think, right. I think I got it. Yeah, I think I'm, I got an extra minute, so yeah. I'll try and talk yeah, fast. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll stop I got. I'm ready to go. Okay, sharing. Let's see. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Everybody see that? All right. Awesome. So uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Stefancic. I'm going to talk a little bit about this technology. Um, I'm joined here with uh, my colleague from Auburn University. You guys may have seen him like unfamiliar face with all the Tennessee folks, but Troy Brady's here as well. And then the, um, the uh, scientist at Auburn that's working on this is Peng Yu Chen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this and then kind of tell you guys why you should work with us and and what we're kind of looking for in this. So um, basically, uh, this drug Antabuse gives triggers a very unpleasant reaction when you drink alcohol and it's been used for over 65 years. You get very, very sick. So it's often used with alcoholics. Um, what they discovered, though, and you see in this little anecdote down here is that um, it had an anti-cancer effect. Um, there was a story here from 1971. A woman had late stage breast cancer. She became an alcoholic because of that. She actually lived over 10 years and died from an inebriated fall out of a window. But when they did the autopsy, they found her bone tumors had melted away and very little cancer was left. So um, this led to multiple studies that were done over the years um, where uh, disulfiram, I'll call it DSF here, was used as an anti-cancer drug that was combined with copper. So copper is a, is a good cofactor in cancer as well. It can affect the structured proteins. So um, figure A, for instance, shows um, this was a large Danish cancer registry. So there were over 3,000 patients that took antabuse, and the death rate was 34% lower for the patients uh, who took the drug before and after their diagnosis. So that's interesting. And then in the lower, um, lower left figure B, you can see that if you combined the DSF with copper, 
you can see the tumor volume has slowed growth over time. So these are all kind of interesting findings. So why haven't we seen this in the market? Um, if this has been around for 65 years, we've known about this since the 70s. Basically, um, one of the issues is you have to take this drug orally, uh, the DSF, and you have to take, if you take the copper separately from the drug, um, because uh, DSF has a very, very short half-life, um, it has limited cancer efficacy and it's failed in almost every clinical trial. So in vitro, they could get it to work really well. It was in vivo was the problem. So they actually came up with this compound, uh, copper DDC. I won't state what that is. It would probably take me seven minutes to, to say that correctly. But CUDDC2 is one form of this drug that could be used. And um, that seemed to be more effective because you were combining the copper with the DSF in this form. Uh, the problem is, is that it has very low solubility. So once again, that hasn't worked very well in clinical use. So the challenge here was to develop a formulation that would solve some of these challenges. And that's what they worked on at Auburn University. And um, here's a here's kind of a cartoon of this. Uh, for the, it, This is the SMILE method that we mentioned in the beginning. And once again, basically we're encapsulating the drug. They're encapsulating the drug into a, into a nanoparticle. Um, and when they do that with the SMILE method versus a film dispersion method you see here, um, when you enclose it in, a, in, in this nanoparticle, and this is the area that our founder uh, or the, 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 uh, the inventor of the technology, Peng Yu Chen, is an expert in, when you, um, when you load this into a nanoparticle, you get much better loading efficiency and you get a much higher drug concentration. So this is very, very uh, promising way to deliver this drug um, and have it be effective um, um, for actual clinical use. Uh, the, the folks at Auburn with some of their partners in their drug development center have done some cancer studies with mice. So they made um, a xenograft tumor model. They essentially put prostate cancer cells in a mouse um, that were uh, resistant to uh, 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 paxitaxel, which is a, a chemotherapy. Um, and you can see that the effects of the actual um, compound that they developed, that NP stands for nanoparticle, there was a lower growth of the tumor. Uh, the tumor weight was much lower, and you can get a sense here in this upper right how the, uh, the, the, the tumor shrunk over time. So this was very exciting. This is work they just published in the last few months. So this is a, um, the, the, the other innovative part about this technology, and this is what they have the patent protection on, was being able to scale this up. So when we saw the technology at Cumberland, and um, I talked to Troy about this, and then we saw they had this patent for scalability, that's when we got excited about it because at Cumberland, we like to work with repurposed drugs because they're much easier to get to market. But of course you have to have a way to scale and manufacture this drug so you could use it for clinical trials. So this, um, this method that Peng Yu's developed also allows for scalable production of this. So why work with us? Um, well, first of all, what are we, what, what are we trying to do here? Um, so this is a technology in, in uh, a company like Cumberland. We, um, we look at this early stage technology. So we're a publicly traded pharma company. Um, CET, we're kind of the nimble, agile uh, uh, sub company underneath. And we kind of look to see, hey, can we in license this technology? Can we spin it off into a company? Can we, um, can we potentially license it to another company? And so there's, there's lots of opportunities here. Um, what we haven't had time to do and what I'm looking for a founding team to help um, um, pitch this is, um, and so basically we're, we're, we're the academic industry partner that I just mentioned, but we're looking to make a go, no go decision on how, on how this project is gonna work in the real world. So you're gonna get really access to what does a pharma company look at, like in terms of all these different risk factors, how, how can you formulate it? How can it be used in a clinical trial? Um, uh, and then um, what's, what's gonna be the cost and the risk associated with that? And is this something that we want to commercialize ourselves or is this something we would out license to a potential partner, maybe a startup? Um, with this project, uh, whoever, if, should you choose to wanna work on this, we're really working this through to the SBIR mechanism 
That's one of our main sources of funding. So you get exposure to learning how to write an SBIR and potentially spin this out from CET. And then finally, you get to work with really cool people. Troy's cool, Peng Yu's cool. I think I'm pretty cool. So you get to work with all of us and, um, and really see how does a big pharma company evaluate a really early stage technology that has some really good IP around it, but still has a lot of questions that need to be answered some of which involve financial and uh, the clinical aspects. So I will stop there and answer any questions. And Troy is also on the call as well, if you have any, any questions about Auburn. All right, Jake, thanks, Jim. All right, any questions? Okay, don't be alarmed if there's no questions. Did a good job. There is a lot of detail there. I mean, that it was pretty obvious where this is. Sounds like a, a good, and this happens a lot, and uh, it's something that's novel, that's not novel, right? Uh, a repurposing of something <laughs> yep. that was for something else. Uh, and these days with nanoparticles and new delivery systems, we see this all the time, right? So, you know, this is a very... Uh, promising piece of technology, uh, and not once did I say War Eagle or anything that I graduated from Auburn or anything about. <laughs> That's so, right, Troy. Uh, yeah, Brian's a yeah, graduate. So there, no, there will be no bias whatsoever. I promise. Uh, what we're so anyway, I think one thing to mention. One thing to mention. Yeah, what we're seeing. What we're seeing out in the market about this is that you know cancer drugs have gotten so ridiculously expensive that. Having a simple solution on this, I mean, the price of this drug is pennies. Yeah. Um, so a lot of bigger pharma companies are kind of shying away from this because there's not much well, in it, there's not much IP around it. But a smaller pharma company yeah. or a startup who could who could demonstrate this might be able to create right. IP along the way um, and kind of kind of have a beachhead in the market. And you're not talking about um, uh, you know, $250, $300 million path to market for this. You're talking probably less that's, than- That's a very interesting, that's a, good, that's a very interesting, and just to kind of curtail this and so we can move into the next thing, but just to respond to what you're saying now, it is it's a very interesting conversation that's happening in the pharmaceutical market right now, especially after we just saw Eli Lilly just say they're going to cap insulin at $35. Finally, right? They're putting a cap on things. You see Mark Cuban successfully selling pharmaceuticals which is $15 overhead, you're seeing new pharmaceutical companies crop up that are having a different level of profit margin, selling products at a different way, at a different mechanism. You're seeing payload carrier companies carrying other people's pharmaceuticals for pennies on the dollar, as opposed to come up with their own mechanisms for delivering drugs into, into your body. So the whole system is kind of changing. Jim, you brought up some really great and valid points there. Part of what we would do in this process for this intellectual property is figuring out the right mechanism to go to market, right? And that might not be Absolutely. the standard fashioned way of going to a pharmaceutical company, a big Eli Lilly or something like that, and selling the product to them and the IP to them for them just to go and, and build out a big solution and own the IP for 20 years. So I think this is a good example of a pharmaceutical product that we could kind of push the envelope on how to bring that to market and commercialize it. So it's a good example. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, uh, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. And, and CET. So let's see how people vote on that one. All right, moving on. We're moving on to Vanderbilt. So who is with the Tamperaware anti-counterfeiting container? Michael Sanborn. I think I saw you on the call. Are you on the call, Michael? Yes, you yes, are. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to make you co-host right Excellent. now. Please confirm when you got it. Uh, yes, I think I can share. Yep. Great. I won't start the clock until you're ready to, to roll. Okay. Can you see the screen? We can. Tampa. Tampa proof package. Excellent. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Sanborn. I'm a C student at Vanderbilt, and this is a business idea that emerged from a research project with my colleague Carlos Alea and our advisors. Dr. Jules White and Dr. Ashok Chowdhury. So problem overview, I think we're all rather familiar with counterfeiting, uh, basically producing uh, undetectable kind of clones or lookalikes of high quality goods and uh, replacing them 
in a supply chain. And one particular aspect of counterfeiting is tampering with shipments in transit. So Amazon sends off a package and you're expecting uh, a, a specific type of item. And once the item gets to you, it's nowhere near the quality that was expected or, or advertised on the site. And so there's a need for this type of digitally enabled or tamper evident packaging. Uh, and it will continue to grow in urgency with uh, the increase in supply chain complexity. Often for systems like cars or uh, airliners, there are hundreds of globally distributed suppliers that are relied on and thousands of components. So uh, very important to basically be able to attribute provenance to uh, anything from very large pieces of hardware down to quite literally nuts and bolts of, of these systems. And the key issue is that shallow identifiers, so things like QR codes and stickers are unreliable for deterring sophisticated counterfeiters. And it's not too difficult to find examples of these issues. So moving on to the scope, industries affected, uh, national defense, medical devices, safety critical components, consumer goods, the financial impact is staggering, I think, uh, north of $4 trillion for 2022 and projected to continue to increase. So what is needed is an unclonable and unit-specific authentication system, something that is more advanced than, again, a shallow identifier like a serial number or QR code that can be easily kind of transplanted uh, across uh, differing quality instances of, of a, a part. And in addition, a packaging system which can reliably detect and report this tampering is also needed. So the approach that we've taken with this problem is to leverage impedance identities as unique signatures or a structure of interest. And these are enabled with a special type of sensor called a piezoelectric sensor basically is a two-way converter between vibration and electricity. They're used commonly in, in things like microphones and um, pressure sensors and uh, certain types of medical devices. And uh, you can imagine this as basically like a form of touch ID or a fingerprint for an arbitrary object. So on the left here, you can see, or sorry, excuse me, at the, the top right, you can see these sensors are, are rather small, kind of on the order of a small coin in, in shape, in size, and they can, uh, they come in various sizes actually. And the plot you see of, of multiple signals is basically, these sensors are attached to multiple instances of an object. And you can see um, pretty evidently that the signals between different instances are noticeably distinguishable. So what we'd like to incorporate in this, in this process, you can see at the bottom uh, left here, we have this system that we envision where an object is created and a sensor is associated with that instance. And as this object moves through a supply chain, the uh, impedance identity, this unique signature, is read and checked uh, across some supply chain path until it is uh, reaches the integrator and is incorporated into the system uh, with high confidence uh, of its quality and provenance. So in terms of the Tampet container, this is initial conception of what it might look like. You can see, uh, you might be wondering, this, this idea started with the intention of directly adhering these sensors to rigid structures and Obviously, not every type of manufactured good is amenable to directly sticking one of these sensors onto it. So we kind of uh, evolved the idea to basically uh, comprise a container where you can see you can uh, put any contents from designer goods to pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and again, be able to determine uh, if and when some tampering or malicious activity is uh, attempted. So the current status of this work, uh, just some administrative things. We have a provisional patent for this technology. We have NSF support uh, through this coming September. Uh, the cost per container and sensor uh, can vary, but it's 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 rather rather low for uh, when you consider the value of the objects that that can be 
kind of protected. And it's important also to mention that the <clears throat> measurement, sorry, the, the measurement device that is obtaining these uh, signatures, uh, a lab grade equipment is, is on the order of thousands of dollars, but there are compact and cheaper solutions that are feasible. So you could imagine like the UPS driver has their package scanning unit, uh, something of that form factor uh, we believe is, is feasible for this type of technology. On the technical level, we have signature data from hundreds of measurements taken over the past few years, software to support the processing and uh, uh, basically similarity assignment classification to these objects. Uh, we have published some technical papers and also completed shipment of uh, these types of parts with, with sensors attached uh, throughout the state. So what we would be interested in learning more about with our technology, uh, with collaborators in this program would be the business viability, the scalability of the technology, what adjacent markets exist, any low hanging fruit and MVP development, uh, competition with incumbent technologies. Um, I don't really have a good grasp of what maybe companies like FedEx or Amazon would be doing um, in this domain, uh, with risk and risk tolerance by market segment, and then which markets maybe late adopters after economies of scale are proven. And with that, I will wrap up. I appreciate everyone's attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I'm going to make a comment that actually, because I have a question uh, and mm -hmm. or it's a statement question. Uh, with the context of life sciences and smart mobility, I can actually see a very viable market for those considering how much or how many smart components are utilized in those two industries, right? So you have exceptionally smart components going into cars. Those components are coming from all over the world. It's easy to, to contemplate someone uh, working into the system to do counterfeit and other things. We've seen this in, with other, uh, other countries putting in uh, counterfeit chips into the system and those making into dozens and dozens of different products and being produced in a large mass scale, right? That can happen and does happen. It can happen in medical devices as easy as it can happen in the large scale production equipment uh, with F-150s per se, you know, it can happen. So is that really where you're seeing, you're not really looking at any specific industry, you're saying the traceability and tracking mechanisms of these things has been important and you've built a solution or some sort of intellectual property technology around uh, ensuring the traceability and, the, and ensuring the authenticity of these products. Is that is that assumption correct? It is. It is, yes. We are not committed to any industry and, and definitely interested in, again, understanding kind of how this technology might fit into the industries you mentioned, uh, but not, there's no one specific industry that's in mind we have considered. Um, medical technology, pharmaceuticals being a large issue, uh, right. as well as safety critical components and the military technology, as you alluded to as well. Great. Any other questions? I think this is a good example of also seeing a technology that doesn't yet have a beachhead and a beachhead. I might have mentioned that a little bit earlier, but a beachhead in our entrepreneurship terms is that first sales area, that territory that you're going to go after first. We generally start by calling those reference cases, those ones where you can apply your technology in not necessarily a simple way, but a less complex way than a larger mass market would normally. Uh, so it's something that you can get to relatively easily, right? Something that is reasonably expecting to be able to get to and, and successfully sell something into. That's something it looks like where we could actually help your intellectual property start honing into where we could do that. There's a great saying that if you're building a product for everyone, you're building a product for no one, right? So if anybody is on this call saying that their product could actually be utilized everywhere, uh, that's great. That's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's awesome to think about, but you may eventually get there in 10, 15 years where everybody in the world has bought your product, but you're going to have to go through each customer segment to get to that, right? And so we have to start somewhere, and that's what this process is, starting somewhere. Okay, great. 
Any questions? Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you. We're going to move on. Next, we have another one from Oak Ridge methods for immunoregulation by modulating plasma and inogen apple nematide, nematide, nematode, sorry, uh, domain containing proteins. I think that was it. It gets me a little, it takes me a couple <laughs> of weeks sometimes to say scientific terms, but I usually get there, still get tongue tied. Who's presenting? Somebody wave their hands. It's all. Is that you? That Great, perfect. Yes. All right. All right, confirm with me when you have co-hosts and you can start sharing and I'll start the clock when you okay. are ready. All right. Great. Okay. So yeah, okay. I'm ready, yeah. yeah. Good, go ahead. Okay, so my name is um, uh, Kuntal Day, and I'm working for Dr. Wellington Mucher, who is the senior staff scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And today my talk is the methods for immunoregulation and how we can modulate the plasminogen apple nematode domain um, uh, in plant immunity, in the prog cancer progression, and in stopping SARS-CoV-2 viral infection. So when we are talking about the plasminogen apple nematode, uh, it actually is a domain which has like four to six cysteine residues. And you can find this universal domain in more than 28,000 protein from archaea to bacteria in plants to animal, including humans. And um, after deep searching, this pan domain has been found uh, in related with the immune regulation or immune activation. Um, so uh, in simple terms, whenever you see this pan domain that in the protein, that protein is related to the immune activation. One of that protein, uh, what we found uh, related to the immune activation is the hepatocyte growth factor or HGF, which is the master regulator for the cancer progression. So if you talk about the brain cancer, pancreatic cancer, gallbladder, stomach, hepato, uh, like HGF is the master regulator. And uh, we have found a pan domain in there. So first we have mutated in the four cysteine residue in the pan domain. And what we saw, like we can block the whole cancer progression into the human cell and the glioblastoma cells. And here on the left side, we are just showing the Western blot and showing that with specific point, it is actually attenuating. So these are the phosphorylation, like a phosphomate, phosphoacate, phosphoerc. These are the major uh, proteins which are important for the cancer progression. And these are actually, if you can see the HGF 416 to alanine in this mutated form, they are, there is no activation of those phosphorylation. Whenever you see in the wild type, you can see in 10, 30, and 60 minutes after HGF stimulation, you can see the activation. So so here is the, on the right side, I put the arrow and specifically this is common in any of the cancer pathway. You can see like ARC1, which is like um, here phosphor ARC, so that is blocked. So stop this in the 416 to alanine, whenever we mutated that pan domain, you can see that attenuation of activation of those phosphorylation and, and thereby it prevents the cancer progression. Next, we in uh, 2019, when SARS COVID actually arrived, one of the um, uh, group from uh, Germany, they found that uh, NRP1, neuropilin 1 protein, it's interact with the SARS COVID spike protein. And uh, my uh, uh, PI actually found this NRP1 has also a pan domain, but it was sitting into the database. And then he asked me that whether I could mutate that NRP1 and see that whether it has any uh, like attenuated uh, interaction with the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then we actually mutated all those uh, cysteine residue. And you can see the first, second, and third all are showing like less interaction with the SARS-CoV-2 
virus, specifically the spike protein. And then we also actually did here the immunolocalization. And you can see this is a wild type version of the spike protein, which is internalized into the cell. But with the, I'm just showing the, because of the time limit, the first cysteine residue mutation. And you can see like it is totally attenuated in the, that uh, spike protein cannot actually internalize to the cell. So how the mechanism is actually happening? Here is the graphics. So here is a spike protein. And you can see like in the normal condition, it can actually interact to the NRP1 protein. And uh, whenever we are mutating that, it actually blocks that interaction. And so, so in the, as we are like a department of energy, so we also relate with the like a bioenergy uh, work. And so we actually found these uh, pan domain exclusively in the G-lectin receptor-like kinases. So G-lectin receptor-like kinases also are very related with the plant immunity. So when we actually mutated the conserved residues of the G-lectin receptor-like kinases, you can see in the mutated version, the MAP kinases are elevated into the plants. And here is the Western blot, which is showing that it is elevated. So on the right-hand side, we are just showing the model, like when we actually mutated the uh, pan domain in the G-lectin receptor like kinases, the hormonal pathway gets activated and which actually gives resistance to the plants. And that, uh, like we can see, like uh, uh, some of the necrotrophic uh, pathogens, uh, they are resist, uh, like the plants are resistant against them, which is actually a good thing and in the crop industry. So here, the, what is the diverse roles of pan domain? So it is not find, uh, found in only one protein. It is found in more than 28,000 proteins and it has like several functions so in the plant immunity. And this is like my, uh, my, my mentor actually performed uh, using like septoria, which actually uh, kills like a lot of poplar trees uh, in the West Coast. And he actually found like mutating the pan domain, it is resistant, the, uh, the trees are resistant. And here uh, in the first Fertility, uh, the pandomain is also important because whenever a sperm enters into the oocyte, the oocyte uh, immune response is suppressed. So it is because of the pandomain. So pandomain actually modulating the immunity. Here is the HGF work, which we published here, like we mutated the master regulator and we can stop the cancer progression. Uh, here, the SARS-CoV-2, we can actually mutate the NRP1 and we can stop that uh, sars cov its internalization and replication and the viral load. And and uh, our future studies is in the malaria because PFAMA1 pan, uh, protein has a pan domain and we want to actually mutate that and see whether it can prevent the malaria and dengue diseases. It also can uh, also found in, in the invasion of the aquatic habitat. So how can we con commercialize? So in cancer, we can develop a small molecular inhibitor again the pan domain because until now, there is a like a full length uh, antibody against the HGF, which are in the clinical trial, but they, nobody actually pinpointed only four cysteine residue or even one single cysteine residue can be targeted to prevent the cancer progression. Similarly, for the we can develop a small molecular inhibitor for the pan domain of the NRP1, and we can actually stop the viral internalization because in the market, we are actually developing vaccines, but they are developing the vaccine for the different variants for the spike protein. but this is the receptor. We can actually change the receptor and act block the internalization. And here is a plant immunity. We can actually mutate the pan domain and make them like disease resistant. And here is the pathway, like what we are thinking in the bloodstream, if we can actually uh, somehow, I'm not a, uh, a drug discovery person, I'm a molecular biologist, but if uh, there is a drug which can target it to the pan domain, and then it can go into the bloodstream and then you, you can see it uh, targets the pan domain, the cancer progression is attenuated or stopped. Similarly, for the NRP1, it can be stopped for the SARS-CoV-2 internalization. We are thankful that we got a lot of highlights and uh, from the uh, US Department of Energy Office of Science, our study was from basic to breakthrough, it was highlighted. And yesterday we got another feather from the Department of Energy and White House Biden's uh, moonshot program that uh, our work was highlighted that it actually, uh, like uh, the national labs, uh, not many national labs actually are uh, working in the cancer field, but um, there are like three, uh, 
uh, labs in the national, uh, like three labs in the DO, under DOE umbrella, which are working in cancer and uh, we are one of them. Thank you. Thank you. So very promising technology, a lot of great applications and the opportunity, a lot of I think digging into the best ways to commercialize, right? This is another one of those things where it has a lot of potential to partner, it has a lot of potential to become a payload mechanism, right? Something to deliver uh, opportunity and a variety of different things. And, and also, if you look at what we're talking about, if I understood it correctly, and I'm trying to sponsor some questions here, but also make some statements, is it's got multiple industries because we looked at cancer and other healthcare things related to SARS CoV 2, but you also had agriculture, right? Starting things <laughs> off, but related to biomedical, but coming from both the agriculture and the environmental side on the mosquitoes and everything else and carriers of those diseases, dengue fever and, and, and malaria. So all these things kind of contribute to the same thing we were talking about with the last couple of them is like, where is the beachhead? Where do we kind of take your technology and start looking at where the initial point of entry is for the market, right? So I think that's a great question to be answered through our process. So I'll open it up to everyone else. Questions? Okay. And again, we are going to, hang on, see, I'm looking at. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we, you know, no questions, no worries, right? There's gonna be plenty to digest. Uh, this is a good time. We're actually, I'm not trying not to jinx anything by saying we're running a few minutes early here. Uh, so I'll take a couple of minutes to go ahead and say one thing, and I'm going to make it real quick. Uh, and uh, the fact is that we're going to record all these. Uh, you'll have time to look at all these IPs again. For all the students that joined us uh, a little late because they had the wrong IP, uh, the wrong Zoom link, sorry about that for the confusion. Uh, but you're here now. You'll be able to hear uh, the last half. I'll send out the recording of this. Uh, probably tonight, if we can get it all rendered and uploaded to, to our YouTube channel, it'll certainly be first thing in the morning. I'm going to give you all through this weekend to review the IP on this recording. So this two-hour session, you can look at it at your leisure as you go through. You don't have to pour through it all at once and fill out the form that I mentioned at the very beginning. And for those that joined a little late, I'll be sending out a Google form that allows you to stack, uh, stack right your, your top five. So we're going to be choosing five of the nine IPs to go through this process based on the number of volunteer founders that we have. So it's going to make some time for you to digest what we're looking for. And I'll also uh, provide the access to the IP holders as well so we can generate questions. I'll facilitate those questions too, and you might have those. And certainly, if you have more in-depth questions and really want to dig into it, if you choose that IP to work on, we're going to get into the weeds with each one of these IPs as a team of founders working with that business, but also as a cohort. So we'll all be asking questions and we'll all be hearing the answers as we move through the cohort over the next nine weeks after this week. So, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Let's just keep maintaining and, put, and muscle through this. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been very exciting so far. I love the technologies. It's been some of the greatest technology we've had to date. So really, really interesting stuff. Uh, really cutting edge stuff. Love to see it, love to hear it. Can't wait to start working on it. Uh, so next we have up from St. Jude, the Lysmol Drugs for Cancer. So who is going to present that? If they can come on to video, wave their hands. Presenter from St. Jude, Chad. It should be Dr. Sandra Dotso. Yeah, Alessandro. Okay. Don't know if they're on the call. Check. We can come back. Do you want to reach out to them? Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll email. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to jump ahead to uh, the next one, which is from uh, Oak Ridge for the, wire, uh, the wireless power system. That should be Veda Prakash. Are they on the call? Oak Ridge. OK. 
Okay. All right, IP number seven, from Vanderbilt, bone biopsy found. I, I just reached out to Sandra and I'm waiting, but it may be that she's supposed to start at seven and I don't yeah, know if people fine. are. We can, we can, if we if can nobody else in. is on here. I'm here. Nick, oh, go ahead then. <laughs> Roll it. Okay, so Nick, you're going to present? Yeah, happy to present now. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to make you co-host. Uh, Yeah, yeah, we see your screen come up. Okay, osteoconfection is what we see. Osteoconfection, you see it okay? Yes, sir, yes, sir, we do. Go when you're ready. All right, first of all, thank you for having me. My name is Nick Chadwick, I'm a radiologist at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I also have the opportunity to lecture and mentor uh, in the School of Engineering as well. And I'm pleased to be here today to speak about osteoconfection, which is your education connection as it pertains to performing bone biopsy. So this technology is for those who do bone biopsies. This includes hematologists, oncologists, orthopedic surgeons, and we radiologists. It requires extensive knowledge of human anatomy and pathology. As you're guiding these needles to the place of interest, it requires mastery of spatial orientation and tactile feedback as you go through the different tissue. Unfortunately, current practice is that the first biopsy we perform is oftentimes on a live patient. And in this era of medical innovation and simulation, we find that to be unacceptable. There are some training models that do exist. Uh, they're rather expensive. Um, they're not completely representative of the material properties of both bone and soft tissue, and they don't address a focal bone lesion, what it feels like to biopsy a focal bone lesion. And I want to draw your attention to the CT image on the left. This is our biopsy needle, which is a coaxial needle going into an iliac bone. And there's a small region of decreased density here. This is a destructive bone lesion. And you can see the inner biopsy needle going into that lesion. On the other end of the spectrum, the image on the right side of the screen is a biopsy needle going into a very dense sclerotic lesion. This is a breast cancer metastasis in this instance. And these lesions can cause the needle to become stuck in them because they're so hard. It's very difficult to get a biopsy needle through it. Sometimes they bend. I have heard of instances where needles actually break. So to be able to practice this on the bench top is beneficial for everyone besides troubleshooting in real time. So our proposed solution is to build a bone biopsy training model, a model that simultaneously has the mechanical properties of cortical bone, which is the outer shell, the mechanical properties of the inner spongy or medullary bone, which is a more porous material with lower resistance, and also to mimic the mechanical resilience of the soft tissue envelope. And that includes the subcutaneous fat, the muscles, the fascia, really the fascia is, is what kind of holds everything together in the soft tissue. We want to make it as easy as possible to disseminate this to the end user and make it as cost effective as possible. We want to have models that are pre-assembled. Some of the models for bone biopsy that are currently used are great models, but it requires the end user to have a 3D printer. And that's not the aim of, of this model. We want to be able to adequately simulate the biopsy of a bone lesion. For we radiologists, it's probably 98% of the bone biopsies we perform is for a targeted image-guided lesion biopsy. We also want to be able to address the troubleshooting techniques that are required for those densely sclerotic lesions where the needle has a, a higher chance of bending and higher chance of mechanical failure of the needle. So the first iteration of this, we printed 3D negatives on a 3D printer. 
and we put those into a thermoplastic mold. And the mold serves as a reservoir into which we can pour the different materials. This is offset a little bit just for, on our end, ease of assembly of these models. And I think this modular technique really makes it stand out from other types of training models because it's really tailored to the end user. So if you think about going into an ice cream shop or a confectionery, you decide cup or cone, chocolate or vanilla, what kind of toppings you want. Uh, my kids love gummy worms on ice cream for whatever reason. But anyways, that's a user ordering a, a product specifically for them. So all of these layers can be tailored for the individual. And I wanna get it to the point where someone comes to me and says, hey, I wanna practice bone intervention on a femur. So I need a soft tissue envelope that's 30 millimeters thick. And I want it to be an individual who's osteoporotic. So can you uh, tone down the hardness value, Shore D or Vickers hardness to reflect the bone that's osteoporotic? So this can really be tailored to the training needs of the individual. Of course, the ability to build in bone lesions by making an area harder than the surrounding areas is also possible. So here we are bench testing these models. Prototype version one is on the left side of the screen. This is me putting a bone biopsy needle into the bone model. Now the first model, our cortical or outer hard shell and our inner medullary bone had really nice material properties reflective of performing a real bone biopsy. But the soft tissue envelope was something that we needed to work on. The soft tissue envelope in this instance is essentially a gelatin mold. And if you'll notice to the left side of where this needle's coming in, it's fracturing there. So that's not acceptable for a robust soft tissue envelope. This is something that we tried to improve upon in the prototype version two. It's a little bit different orientation of thermoplastic mold and 3D printed negative. Final version of prototype two is on the right side of the screen. It's a nice, robust soft tissue envelope. This fits over the cortical and medullary bone and it provides nice support when you're biopsying the bone. The idea is to be able to keep this on the shelf, bring it down when new trainees come through or when you go to a medical interest group that focuses on bone biopsies have the students learn on this, and then be able to store it away for the next usage. So as we continue to reach out to physicians and scientists at Vanderbilt to build our third iteration, we also really need a market analysis. We need to see if we can identify that product market need with IP portfolio matrix or development of a business case. And that's why I was uh, so elated to be invited to uh, present this to you all this evening. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions? I think this will be an interesting conversation on scalability. I mean, I can see I the have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Angelita. Hi, I'm Angelita. Um, my question is, who is the target market for this technology? Is it um, individual students or is it um, universities or who is the? Sure, target? it can it can be both. Uh, you know, as we as an individual identifies that they want to go into medical school, and then once they're in medical school and trying to figure out what specialty they go into, they will try to uh, immerse themselves in different experiences with different specialties. And this could be uh, a model that's used for a uh, orthopedic interest group just to learn how to practice bone biopsies, orthopedic residents during their first couple weeks of residency will go through a boot camp where they learn how to operate drills, put in screws, fix hardware to bone. Uh, of course, in the radiology realm, um, our, our trainees are expected to, to learn how to perform bone biopsies. Uh, it can be used in industry. If, a, if industry is trying to sell you a bone drill, 
Then they need a model on which to teach how to use the bone drill. Um, the better the model is, the more reflective that model is of human bone. Uh, it would be easier for, for a physician to get an idea of how it works in real life. This is supposed to replace trying to procure a cadaver. So cadaver would be the gold standard. Very difficult and costly to find cadavers. If you're talking about practicing uh, the biopsy of a bone lesion, it's impractical to try and find cadavers that, that have uh, bone tumors. Um, so it's, it's really any kind of training, you know, or the um, hematologists and oncologists will do bone marrow aspirates, and uh, we can tailor the model to have a, a cortex and a medullary space that is reflective of performing a bone biopsy uh, where they commonly biopsy, which is the posterior aspect of a pelvic bone. So a lot of a lot of avenues and education and training that that um, we can potentially affect. Yeah, you know, this, when we get into customer segmentation, this will be considered a niche market, but mm -hmm. niche markets can be very, very lucrative. So, Angelita, did that answer your question? Oh yes, thank you. I also had another question. I'm not sure if you can answer now, but. Do you have any idea of the cost of uh, this technology? So right now to- If you don't yes. mind, Nick. Go ahead, Ashok. Ashok. Ashok Chowdhury, I'm collaborating with Dr. Chadwick on this project. Mm -hmm. So there, are to both your questions, the first one and this one, I will say there are a few companies that make these models and sell them right now. The point is that those models are not reflective of the, of the true mechanical properties and what uh, osteosurgeons face when they have to actually do the job. So uh, Dr. Chadwick addressed the education market, all the med schools, the companies that make the mechanical devices for bone, um, bone cutting, bone drilling, all of that. The cost of the current cost of the models is not very high, but there is a significant volume to the market. And this technology is probably going to cost very little once the mold is set up. And by mold standards, these molds are rather inexpensive. So we don't have a dollar value yet because we have just tried it in the lab. And that is one of the things that we would like a group yeah. such as yours to address. What would it be in volume? Yeah, I think that's I think that's an area. I mean, that's what I'm glad you said that. I think that's an area of opportunity that we can come to, and and, and we're going to move on right after I make this statement because for time, but the, to close this out and and we can come back and spend a lot of time talking about this, Angelita too. And I I, I really appreciate your interest and those great questions that you asked. Appreciate that too. Uh, the materials for this probably are fairly inexpensive. The process for this is probably fairly inexpensive, especially with. CNC and 3D and everything we have from a, a printing perspective, but the profit margin probably could be fairly extensive because of the lack of availability of supply of a, of a viable alternative. I love what you were saying about the fact is you can't just go pick up a cadaver that meets all the standards and in a large metropolitan area where you have one, two, or three cadavers. How are those split out amongst all of the osteo physicians that are in that area to do all the training and everything else? I mean, you're not it's not a big, it's not a big supply of an alternative, right? So even though this might be a niche and it might be a skin, that's why I said earlier, I, and I wanted to bring up the scalability thing, not as something to say, oh, this can't scale, but this is something to, to an, analyze and to figure out how to make it profitable at the level that it can scale, right? So there you go. 
right? So uh, I think this is a very, you know, unique, uh, I like having something. Uh, we've had some mass market opportunity technologies so far. This will be a great example of working on something that's a niche segmentation of a market. So great, uh, love the technology. All right, Thank let's you. move on to the next one. We can, ask, we can ask more questions as we move along. Like I said, we're gonna facilitate questions over the weekend as well. Okay, uh, do we have, um, all right, so we're gonna move on. We're probably gonna come back to St. Jude and uh, the o Oak Ridge one, but uh, let me ask about the Oak Ridge wireless power system. Do we have anybody on the call for that one? No, okay, so let's go to UTRF, the AI-based retinal hemorrhage detection on CT. Hi, Brian, yeah, uh, this is Nadim, I'm here. Uh, my my camera has decided to not work at this inopportune time, but uh, everyone on the call should consider themselves fortunate to not have to <laughs> look at me while I while right, I do you this. have a great great voice for radio at least, so we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> well thank you. We'll let that go. I just made you co-host, uh, so okay. let's see if you got that uh, ability. Should be able to share it. Yep, we see that coming up now. Do you? Great. Great. So you can me, save your uh, babies for further abuse. And we see your whole slide now. So I'll start the clock when you're ready. Wonderful. Thank you. My name is Nadeem Shafi. I'm a pediatric ICU physician at the Bonner Children's Hospital in Memphis. Um, and it's uh, a real privilege to be able to come and speak to you about our IP, which has to do with saving babies from further abuse using artificial intelligence um, for medical image analysis. So I'm really just one member of a, of a large team, which consisted of a remarkable co collaboration between two data scientists, pediatric neuroradiologist, two pediatric ophthalmologists, a child abuse pediatrician, uh, and our chair of bioinformatics, who himself is an epidemiologist and biostatistician. Uh, um, and so this work that I'm going to share with you has been developed um, as a result of this collaboration over the course of really uh, uh, two years um, or so. So I want to start by asking you all to imagine something for me. Uh, imagine that a mother brings a child to an emergency room, say, in my hometown in Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is about 45 minutes south of Memphis. Um, and that child, you know, she brings him in because the baby is irritable. Um, the child gets looked at by the emergency physician, and uh, really the physician decides that the baby's just teething, and the child gets discharged home. Well, about a month later, the mom brings the child back because the child is really just inconsolable. Um, the ED physician takes an extra step of doing some labs and then doing a CAT scan of the child's brain to make sure that nothing's the matter. That appears to be normal on first pass, and uh, the ED physician decides the baby just has gas and discharges the patient. Well, then it turns out that this baby is brought back uh, three weeks later. This time, the baby is having seizures, it's unresponsive. Uh, the babies referred to our center here in Memphis, um, and a scan shows uh, a lot of brain injury, and then the image below is taken by a pediatric ophthalmologist, which is really a specialty that only exists at centers like ours. And when the pediatric ophthalmologist looks at the back of the eyes called the retina, they see lots of hemorrhages. And these hemorrhages are a telltale sign that the child has been abused for probably the last two months or so. Um, so, uh, babies, unfortunately, um, in my line of work, we see this, uh, up to 5,000 cases of abusive head trauma can be, uh, have been seen in a single year in the United States. Um, a quarter of those small children and babies will die. Uh, of those that survive, 40% will experience severe disability, but even if they escape with only mild, uh, disability, um, they experience a remarkable reduction in their quality of life. But here's the kicker. Uh, a quarter to a third of those babies uh, who are missed despite having encounters in the medical setting. And this is really the, the, what we want to target with our IP. So normally in the medical profession, we try to get a story from the family. But in these particular instances, when a child is being abused, that story can be misleading. It can be changing. And the symptoms that a baby presents with can really not tell the tale in itself. Oftentimes, these children will get head CTs in the emergency department. Um, the trouble is that on a head CT, um, 
it, unless there's a retinal hemorrhage that is just exceptionally large, retinal hemorrhages, which are the telltale sign of abuse, cannot be detected. Um, and so the, really the gold standard for detecting retinal hemorrhages are this, uh, is this retinal exam that's done by pediatric ophthalmologists. That means that the specialist has to come in. So there's a time delay. Not all babies are referred. As, um, so there's a referral bias. The exam itself is uncomfortable for patients. And so they need to be sedated. And then um, not all of these uh, scans are positive. Um, so many of these uh, examinations can be avoided. So the retinal exam, as of right now, is really safe for those babies that have uh, the highest suspicion of being abused. So we, the challenge we took on for ourselves is to ask the question, can artificial intelligence-based analysis of pediatric head CTs predict the presence or absence of retinal hemorrhages? And this was a really good time to ask this question because right as we were starting to ask it, people were starting to publish in the literature about the possibility of artificial intelligence assisting um, in child abuse imaging in various ways. So what we did is we looked back at our records and we were able to find 301 children uh, that were younger than of age three years um, who had been diagnosed with abusive uh, head trauma. Um, and what not all children with abusive head trauma have retinal hemorrhages. In our cohort, we had 120 that had them, 181 that didn't, but every child also has uh, two eyes. And so what that really meant for us is we could, we could consider 218 eyeballs or globes that had retinal hemorrhages and almost 400 globes that did not. So we took uh, that population of patients, we took their CAT scans, a certain series of them called, that are oriented in the horizontal direction and cut about five millimeters apart. Um, and then we applied to this uh, to these CAT scans an algorithm that's been used in adults to isolate the globes um, digitally. Um, but we applied it to pediatric CAT scans, and this was the first time that this has been done. When we did this, we found that there were portions of the globe that were missed, and there were also portions of um, that were identified as globe that weren't really globes. Uh, in order to correct this, we came up with a completely new, first time ever done way um, of straightening these scans as a first step, um, because oftentimes these patients are just not positioned uh, correctly in the, um, in the scanner. And we needed these scans to be straight because once we can straighten them, we devised a way of really cutting out the rest of the image so that we can just have the globes themselves. And then we were able to separate those globes, mask the rest of the tissue around them, stack these images, and really have three-dimensional globe representations that we could work with. Because we had uh, retinal exams on every one of these patients, we were then able to take this population of globes, label which ones had retinal hemorrhages, label which ones didn't. And then we took a good portion of these and um, we told a, we, we chose a machine learning algorithm. This is for those that are familiar, a convolutional net, neural network based algorithm that is previously been trained on over 20 million images to be able to identify features on the images. On uh, our data scientists um, took those, fine tuned some of the learning layers in this algorithm, and then told the algorithm which globes had retinal hemorrhages and which globes didn't, and asked it to develop a model that would able, be able to predict um, the presence or absence of retinal hemorrhage. Then we took the remaining globes and fed it into the model and said, asked the, you know, basically assessed how well that model did. And here's what we, we were able to find. So yeah, as I said, the ophthalmologist guided retinal scan is really the gold standard and it finds 100% of retinal hemorrhages. Radiologists can find uh, many of these hemorrhages on an MRI, but that is a much more extensive procedure, which also requires referral and sedation and so forth. And even then, radiologists can only see just over 60% of these, although there's a range um, because of it depends on the severity of the hemorrhage. But radiologists can only see 3% of these retinal hemorrhages on CAT scans. After training our machine learning model to be able to do this on its own, we were able to change that all the way up to 80% of retinal hemorrhages being able to be detected 
on CAT scans by our artificial intelligence guided uh, readings of them. That is uh, probably an underestimate as well because every CAT scan has two eyes. And so um, that basically means that each CAT scan will have, there will be two opportunities to detect retinal hemorrhages on each scan. And this sensitivity will go up quite a bit more when we, when we do those numbers. And so what does this work offer? It basically tells us for the first time that retinal hemorrhages can be predicted by AI assisted image analysis of pediatric head CTs. Um, this can really, in a very real sense, reduce uh, missed cases of abusive head trauma. What that means is we have, uh, uh, we're, you know, we have the possibility of using technology now to um, really reduce the amount of abuse that babies and small children can experience. It can also offer decision support in communities like Holly Springs where there are no pediatric ophthalmologists or neuroradiologists. Um, and so when that physician is, is, is thinking about um, keep holding on to this baby and referring them to Le Bonner, they'll have more information to go on to be able to assure them that that's the right decision to make. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, this technology may also offer guidance about which patients need these exams and eliminate unnecessary exams as well. And then there is the broader possibility that now that we've developed this technology to be able to pick up retinal hemorrhages, there are many other ocular pathologies um, that we could adapt this technology for. And so the business part of it, what I've told you so far is the part that we know really well. Uh, the slide I'm about to present to you now is the part that we don't. <laughs> Um, and so here's Le Bonner Children's Hospital, and within Le Bonner Children's Hospital, we have CAT scanners. Uh, ours is, happens to be made by Toshiba, and connected to these CAT scanners are uh, uh, software packages that um, analyze and process those medical images, those CAT scans. Our company happens to be uh, Terra Recon, although there are several others that exist that I've listed there. The 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 machine learning approach that we've developed cannot have an impact right now. What it needs is to be able to be either incorporated into um, some of the software systems that process these medical images um, so that perhaps there is a button on them to, that can be pushed to analyze for retinal hemorrhages, for instance. Or the other way in which we've th thought about this is um, if we could, uh, develop a small business of our own that has the algorithm, allow the hospital system to feed us the CAT scan and essentially provide, you know, sell our services to the hospital for reading these CAT scans. Those are just two ideas about how this could be incorporated into workflow and translate into really impacting patient care. Um, but um, there are probably more that we haven't thought about because this is, this is the area where we really need the help. Um, but ultimately, we're hoping that you will choose to work with our IP because um, we hope that, um, you know, you'll be um, excited and fulfilled with taking part in a project that um, really has the potential to reduce child abuse um, and save and save children. Um, with that, I'll pause and uh, take your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dean. May, I, may I ask a question? This is Ashok yeah. Chaudhary. Um, Absolutely. So, Dr. Shafi, the, the question I have is, since this is almost a medical decision system, are there any regulatory concerns? Yeah, um, that's a uh, great question, sir. So, the, the technology itself would have to undergo uh, an appropriate degree of validation in larger populations and be applicable to a broad enough spectrum of scan types. Once that's achieved um, and the, uh, the role of the, you know, the performance of the model is acceptable enough, um, then that uh, surpasses any, any regulatory requirements. Um, that come from it, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, the, it sounds like Thank a, you. a few things, and we need, and we need to kind of move on. And there's going to be some more, more to ask uh, the questions and, and find out more about technology 
you know, every year it seems like we have something that impacts the, the youngest of, of all of us. And it's always worthwhile to have those uh, in there, especially with the boon that we keep seeing over and over again with population growth and everything else. Uh, and this is a space that's very, very worthwhile. We need to figure out or help figure out where the marketplace is. Uh, and I do see, uh, you know, I, I can first see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, gotchas, uh, a lot of things that are going to be probably natural uh, blockers of getting a technology like this into the, the space. As much as it, it could be a requirement and needed to do that, uh, as much as it is good technology and very, very helpful and very, very impactful, we have to find a business narrative that makes it sensical for a, you know, you know an academic, a, a hospital to want to do this, right? Um, and I think parents and a, a large group of individuals that may not be the end customer might push for something like this. Uh, so we need to see where the beachhead for this. I think this is a very compelling uh, piece of intellectual property that has a lot of challenges to it, but I think a lot of really uh, interesting challenges that, that can be overcome. So I, I really appreciate the challenge. It's kind of what's in our title of what we do. So thank you very much. I think that was a great uh, presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, we'll follow up with more questions and let's move on to our next technology. All right, so we have uh, Chad Riggs from St. Jude's going to present the uh, license mall drugs for cancer. No, I'm not saying that correctly, but Chad, you, you got you're it. You're doing a great job. <laughs> You've already told them more than I know. So uh, I've got sure Dr. Alessandra Dotso on the call. She had some technical trouble at work, and I don't know if anybody else had to update Zoom, but uh, I'll move ahead and share screen. And I'll go to um, the wrong Firefox. Hang on. And hang on one second. So this is on our web page, and I'll share the link. But it's not a slide deck. It's a licensing success story. So you're saying, why is Chad giving us a licensed IP. Well, we licensed these lysosomal storage drugs or the drugs to treat lysosomal storage disorders for neurodegenerative disease. And we did that in 2015 and they're uh, available for other fields. So Dr. Dotso pictured here with her lab people around her has done work in this area for a great many years. And many people have not realized that the basic elemental way that these lysosomal storage disorders and these lysosomes work. And so the first thing that they cued in on is there may be things to do with neurodegenerative disease, but it, there's increasing information that points that this may be a breakthrough for cancer. So the lysosome is the digestive system in the cell. And I'm sorry, I'm reading this, but it sure, it ensures the homostatic balance in the cell. And, um, when they don't properly uh, degrade, uh, undigested or unprocessed materials accumulate and they cause problems. That's a lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, anyway, they looked at multiple lysosome degradation and cellular constituents uh, here. And these enzymes uh, form a high molecular weight lysosomal multi-enzyme complex, which is required for the mutual stability in lysosomes, which causes, um, you know, Three genetically distinct human neurogenerative lysosomic storage, storage disorders result from a singular combined deficiency of uh, these enzymes. So galactosialidosis, GM1, gangliosidosis, and sialidosis. So I, I was able to say those words after 333 attempts. Uh, so anyway, uh, her work has centered on three lysosomal enzymes. There they are, neuraminidase, B, galactosidase, and protective protein cathepsin A, PPCA is what we're gonna call that. These enzymes form a high molecular weight lysosomal multi-enzyme complex required for mutual stability in lysosomes and full enzymatic activity. So three genetically distinct, oh, I read, sorry, there's, Chad? Those three again. I'm sorry, I skipped up. Chad? Yes. Can I interrupt you? Because yeah, I, I think I can, uh, I, I don't know uh, if I uh, still able to um, 
to share a few slides, but uh, uh, maybe I can help you to introduce this if you want me to, and, uh, and maybe uh, I can uh, convey the whole idea behind it uh, in, in, yeah. a, in a relatively yeah. simple way. Yeah, we only have about five minutes for the total thing. So exactly. What, yeah, so go ahead. I, can, yeah, so. I can convey the idea. So uh, the, all, um, uh, 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 the whole set of studies, as Chad had mentioned, I work on a complex of three large isomal enzymes that are linked by either single or combined efficiency to three um, independent, clinically and biochemically distinct uh, um, uh, lysosomal storage diseases. Um, we have generated really um, faithful models for this, uh, for all three conditions. And the one that is particularly relevant for this uh, um, uh, conversation is the uh, neuraminidase deficiency that leads to a disease called the sialidosis. The whole uh, um, set of studies started when we identify neuraminidase as an important regulator of a process that is called the lysosomal exocytosis. Uh, whenever new one is deficient, so it's obviously um, uh, affect the uh, extent to which the cell um, can exocytose lysosomal content. So uh, in absence of new one, uh, there is an excessive tendency of lysosomes to dock at the plasma membrane and by, uh, by means of a calcium, uh, increasing calcium concentration, local calcium concentration, they release their content extracellularly. In absence of new one, this particular phenomenon is very much exacerbated. So we started to dig into the potential consequences of this, of this uh, uh, process, not only in the context of these pediatric lysosomal storage diseases, disease, but also in the context of other conditions, because looking at the characteristic, especially of the connective tissue in the one deficient mice, we notice that this uh, um, tissue expanded uh, tremendously. The fibroblasts remain partially differentiated, have the tendency to be very highly exocytic. They continue to be proliferative and they tend to be invasive. So they are much more migratory. So, Translating this to a cancer setting, we basically demonstrated that a down regulation of this enzyme in the context of a cancer model, like the alpha minus minus mice, for instance, we noticed that these mice have the tendency to uh, progress to uh, to uh, progress into uh, cancer type, especially sarcomas, that were very, became very aggressive, migratory and potentially metastatic. So we actually uh, think that modulating the, uh, not only the um, uh, uh, enzyme itself, but also the substrates, the enzyme control, and the, uh, in turn, the pathway that the substrates uh, govern, we might be able to revert phenotypic alterations in cancer cells that make them uh, particularly aggressive, migratory, and metastatic. So that's, in a nutshell, what uh, uh, the old uh, issue or the old uh, concept is about. Great. Thank you, Dr. Diazzo. <clears throat> Chad, yeah. uh, you did a great job. You did a so, great job. Thanks. Not, not as good as Dr. Diazzo, though. She, she definitely. Yeah, definitely I, I, well, I circled back to the same thing with my stupid scroll, but then uh, 
I, I'll just point out and let you move on. I posted the value proposition, what we're looking for. Yeah. And then I posted the key developmental assets. We have the mice and everything else that, you know, will, will allow this to move forward. It's a, it's a bigger task than uh, some of the other things we've looked at, but I think it's could be a real breakthrough. Thanks. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we, so actually formerly employed at St. Jude a number of years ago, St. Jude produces an electrical property uh, on the day, on the daily, it's, it, it seems like it's it's just a constant stream. They have uh, uh, labs and labs and labs. They have every level of testing they can possibly imagine there. Uh, and, and they have a tremendous catalog of licensable technology that they've already put into. And they license that technology all around the world, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that that product and that technology has been commercialized, right? And that's a big sure. thing that Chad and myself and a lot of physicians at St. Jude are still trying to do, which is to say, okay, great, we know. And so the good news is, the great news is the amount of data that is surrounding these research components is massive. The data sets are huge. The amount of slices and dices you can take against these data sets can really show you all sorts of different ways of looking at this technology and really proof point a lot of different things. And the, like I said, the data set is just huge. So figuring out where we can commercialize these things is our goal, right? So these, these are great examples of something that's in the licensable market already. It's being utilized around the world. St. Jude has done this for decades upon decades, and there's still opportunities to commercialize. And that's where our challenge is. So I really think this is a great set of technologies. You always get something around this space in St. Jude. I really uh, hope we can work on this one too and we get some interest there. So thank you very much, Dr. Diazzo. Chad, again, did a good, good job. You did a better job saying those words than I do. Uh, so that's great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Okay. All right, we'll collect questions. We need to move on to time because we have two more that we're gonna try to get into and we'll collect questions over the next couple of days and pass those on if we have them. Uh, Chad did do a great job of putting the link to the webpage into the chat, as well as a value proposition and a couple of things. I will send the transcripts as long as the recording with everything to everyone that's on the call uh, by midday tomorrow. So everyone has the weekend to digest. Uh, so we'll have the transcripts from the chat as well. Okay, so we have a couple of more. I'm not sure they're online, so we might have an opportunity to ask questions in general. We might not. So let's go to the final one we have from Oak Ridge, which is a wireless power system. Uh, so if Veda Prakash is on here, Galakrir, don't think so. Don't see anything like that. All right, so we're going to move on to Sebastian. Sebastian, you're on here, right? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Yeah, so, well, Sebastian, I know, you presented, I know you presented last last week in a smaller group. I'm just going to ask you to do it again, if you don't mind. Uh, and I'm making you a co-host right now. Okay, thank you. see your screen coming up yep tft 100 you can go when you're yeah, ready. good okay uh, if everyone can see my screen yes sir we sure we can okay great thank you brian for uh, for this opportunity so uh, my name is sebastian from uh Wayne, kenya uh we are developing uh a gadget for tft 100 with the collaboration with uh teletonic uh, immobility and we have a gadget that can be able to capture the distance from the uh, from the electric vehicles that will be able to capture the data. That's, uh, for the example, when you you you, uh, you are moving, it can be able to capture the data from the electric vehicle compared to uh, the fossil vehicle. The distance covered, then it converts it in terms of the uh, carbon tokens, and this carbon can be able uh, to be traded like any other. Uh, um, can be offset uh, in the uh, in the compliance market. It can be offset uh, in the uh, voluntary uh, carbon uh, market, or even be able to trade it. Uh, like any other uh, digital uh, asset. So in these, we are converting the uh, the carbon 
in terms of from the uh, electric vehicles into digital or asset representative as a token. So one token equals to one ton of carbon that have been captured using this gadget. So this gadget, uh, we have programmed it uh, uh, so that it can be able to reflect in or read the carbon data. So uh, it can be able to uh, communicate with the uh, electric vehicle, uh, BMS, uh, like the 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 uh, different types of bms in every car that are being built and most uh, most of them they are uh, we call ca and the can uh, model that will be able to uh, integrate it with uh, with the electric vehicles so on the other hand you can be able also to see um, you can be able to uh, one wire interface for monitoring and temperature data from the uh, uh, from the electric vehicles, you can be able to put it in a two wheeler and also oh, the, the uh, IP67 uh, classification degree of protection from water and, and dust. So in this gadget, uh, you can be able also to to, to upgrade it uh, in a, in a, um, what we call the, the fire and uh, configuration update uh, offer the photo whereby uh, you can be able to upgrade it without uh, any uh, uh, you can be able to upgrade the, the software uh, remotely so on that uh, it also creates uh, or, or you can connect the device from a nine volt to uh, 96 volts uh, range thus it can be able to accommodate uh, different models and from the different uh, electric vehicles so this device also or communicates with uh, the bluetooth from the um, from the electric vehicle that also it, you cannot only be able to integrate it with the, uh, the battery bms or the car controller you can be able to connect it via Bluetooth from the uh, BMS, uh, uh, from the uh, device BMS. So in this, uh, you can different use. We have a different use. You can use it in a, in a two wheeler, three wheelers. You can put it in e-scooters and also or the kick, uh, the uh, scooter kicks. You can use it for the uh, electric vehicles that are in different, the, the commercial cars and also uh, the main, electric vehicles so in these uh, you you uh, the the device can be able to be connected and give uh, the real data so from uh, from the gadget you can be able to see uh, when it is up when it is uh, um, the, the status uh, on a physical way so in this module uh, we have the tetonica tm2 uh, uh, tm2 uh, 500 so uh, these are the module of, of the gadget and the technological uh, side of it to have uh, gsm and gprs gnss and bluetooth so in these uh, uh, features you can be able to have uh, real data from anywhere you are uh, uh, you can be able to access it in anywhere using the satellite. So in these, uh, the GNS, it have GPS, uh, Gronsas, uh, and uh, Galileo. You can be able to uh, all these uh, features can be able to uh, to be incorporated into this device. So the accuracy of uh, of this device when it comes to giving the real data, when it comes to giving the real data. Uh, is uh, approximately or it gives an accuracy of three meters that is equal almost the size of the car so it can be able to give you the real exact location and the distance covered in a minimum of uh, three meters so in that it also supports uh, the cellular uh, in terms of the the, the the sim card or sim is uh, the sim slot that have been inserted it has a multiple or, or multiple or, or configuration whereby when this uh, uh, sim card is put in it can be able when for example you go to different uh, it, uh, from different uh, uh, providers so in this it switches automatically from one uh, network provider to another so it is a, a, a multi uh, a multi sim card that can support several or carriers 
So in this, in terms of uh, the antenna, DNS antenna, and also oh, the, the high uh, the high crane. So in this uh, device, the interface, uh, it have been made a little bit smaller so that it can be able to fit in even, uh, even for the, uh, um, the smallest uh, device electric devices that uh, they are they are available so in terms of the sensors uh, it uses accelerometer so whereby in this you can be able to detect when it is in motion when it is being towed when it is uh, in excessive uh, idling and uh, those uh, features that when it come to motion so oh, i'll go to the next slide So in these uh, uh, scenarios that I had uh, mentioned earlier, it can uh, give you the details of uh, uh, if you are having a, a green driving, if you are doing or, or you are uh, over accelerating, over uh, speeding detection, jamming detection, and also give, uh, for example, all the, 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 the radiators and uh, uh, the control via a call, excessive idling detection, immobilizer, and also I button led notification. It can tell you from your uh, from the phone, and also uh, class detection when somebody has uh, uh, an accident from which angle the uh, all the it was tilted, the car was moving in a in a uh, certain direction or it was uh, loading up so this one can be able to give uh, those data in real time so in that it can also give the the the, the sleep mode ultra deep or online deep sleep you can be able to monitor everything so in that it has a configuration from the web a or, or platform but we, what we have done uh, we have come up with uh, 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 a, a software, a blockchain uh, software. To, when you get, you can be able to connect these uh, uh, from the protocol that you can be able to connect the device in our um, in our platform, whereby you can see the real data. And now, in as the device or as the uh, electric vehicle move, you can be able to see the real carbon being calculated in a real time. Uh, 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 re report. So in that, it is one of the kind that we have developed and it have not been um, uh, anywhere in the world. So in this, we want to put it uh, as a, a, the major uh, or the first one to put it in the market. So in terms of uh, 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 regulation, regulatory, we have applied to fail a, a standard that uh, for accreditation, and also oh, we are in the pipeline from the uh, gold standard that we uh, we get this um, technological or, or aspect being uh, uh, put into uh, into the record that nobody else will be able to calculate or to use that kind of uh, uh, approach uh, for the carbon uh, market trading so good Hello. Yeah, sorry, I had a mute button. I was frantically pushing it and it was not working. Uh, yes, that's good. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay. So any questions about next steps? We talked about this earlier. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Sorry, I should have closed that out with you. Uh, thank you very much. A very interesting technology again. Uh, I love the idea of what we're talking about here around, you know, everything related to, again, uh, smart tracking of technologies of, of vehicles and making sure that that's, that could be, uh, you know, something that's uh, certainly paid attention to is from the technology perspective, really appreciate the, the, the technology. Uh, so moving forward, what we're going to do from here, uh, as everyone has seen the technologies, I'm going to send out a recording uh, tomorrow. Once I've rendered it and move, uploaded it to our channel, sorry, I'm multitasking a little bit here. You can see me kind of stumbling on what I'm saying. Apologize for that. So we'll take the recording. We'll upload that after we've rendered it and edited it a little bit, make sure it's uh, got everything it needs. We'll also send out a form for you to stack rank your, your interest in the IP. Uh, we'll give you to Monday to do that. Uh, and I'll send out a reminder 
uh, for that form, but I'll go ahead and send out the form as well as the links and a few other things uh, to for the information for all the founders. Uh, also follow up with everyone with uh, some other notes tomorrow as well. Uh, I really appreciate everyone and their interest, all the IP holders. I, I, I can't thank you enough uh, that are still here holding on, uh, that have made it through the other IP holders presentations. I know some of them dropped off. Uh, I hope everyone found them as interesting as I did. I love hearing these things. I love seeing what's going on in the state of Tennessee and the surrounding. I love seeing the connections between Tennessee and other states, uh, specifically between CET and Auburn. That was great. Uh, if there's any questions, please, it's a good time to ask. We have a few minutes. I also like to give you back time. So we said we're going to go to about 8.05. It's 7.52. So if there's not any questions, we can also conclude a few minutes early. Um, but if you have questions, we can talk about those now, or you can follow back up with, the, with email. Uh, otherwise, there'll be a lot of information coming to you tomorrow. Formally, we'll start next week. Uh, for those that are going to be joining us week to week on the cohorts, uh, we'll be sending out invitations. You'll get those from me. You'll be getting new Zoom links. Uh, for those, we'll be standing those meetings up every Thursday. Uh, there'll also be a courtesy invite for all the IP holders, too. Uh, I encourage you all to join from time to time and be a part of the team. Uh, they certainly will be reaching out to you with a lot of questions. Uh, so it's kind of an expectation for you to be there uh, for them. But certainly the invitation is always open for you to be a member of this team as well. So there's nothing excluding you from doing that. But we do know you'll have a lot of other things going on, too. Uh, so I'll open it up real quick, see if there's any questions, and then we'll conclude if there's not. Okay, great. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Y'all got seven minutes back in your Thursday evening. Very appreciative of your time.